Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to our webinar, Reduce Learning Friction, Five Ways to Obtain 100% Participation in Your Training. I'm thrilled to have everybody here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just some housekeeping to get started. First of all, please notice that we have a, a chat feature as well as a Q&A feature. We'll be looking at the chat feature, uh, monitoring questions that you have as well as handling um, any um, uh, questions or technical problems. So if you don't mind in the chat, just let me know that you can see me, you can see my slide. It would really lower my blood pressure. So um, folks, just uh, I'll be watching the chat, just making sure people can see stuff. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, well, we're excited to do this webinar today. Um, we're gonna move along quickly. Uh, we know that you are all busy and we value your time. So thank you for, so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna first introduce myself and then I have a, a great friend and colleague that's joining as well. Um, so my name is Vince Hahn. I'm the founder of Mobile Coach. We are a SaaS-based chatbot authoring platform located in the great state of Utah. Um, and um, my background, I'm a technologist. I'm very passionate about uh, building technology that's actually usable. And so we spend a lot of our time thinking about engagement, which really, um, I think, comes into play with today's topic. And I'm thrilled to be joined by Stephen Baer. And Stephen, welcome. I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, thanks so much, Vince. I appreciate it. Uh, so my name is Steve Baer. I'm a co-founder of The Game Agency. Um, so we are a custom software development company focused on training and education games. And we also are the creators of a platform called The Training Arcade, which is a SaaS platform focusing on building training games for both schools and corporations. Really excited to be here, really fun topic. Great, thank you, Stephen. And just, uh, I, I just wanna tell, I will spend a minute telling the story of how this uh, joint webinar came, came about. So we've been looking at, uh, we go to trade shows, we are out there and we have seen the game agency and it started uh, forming a friendship and, and a collegial relationship. And as we started talking about business, we realized that we have a lot in common in terms of our passions, our sensibilities, and we said, hey, you know, we've learned a lot in our respective businesses. What kind of things could we um, share to our audience? And um, we, when we brainstormed that, on that, it became, this came together pretty quickly around you know, a huge challenge that corporate trainers have is friction, learning friction. And we're going to talk a little, all about that today and share some of our experiences. So I'm thrilled that uh, Steve has joined me. We're actually uh, joking earlier where now I'm very intimidated because Steve is so smart and has so much experience, I'm gonna have to work really hard so that I'm not, uh, you know, I can sort of catch up today. Um, I think it might go the other way around, but we're, <laughs> <laughs> but we're excited about this, it'll be fun. All right, so in this webinar today, here's what we're gonna cover. We're gonna define learning friction, and then we are gonna cover uh, five solutions. Um, uh, hopefully these will be uh, practical, uh, sensible solutions for you if this is a topic that uh, uh, is relevant to your organization. Of course, the game agency, Mobile Coach, we're gonna talk about games, we're gonna talk about chatbots and uh, why they're necessary and, and really great solutions to uh, make a frictionless training experience. Um, and then lastly, we've actually done some really fun work together. We're gonna to show off a little bit at the end of the webinar today. Throughout the webinar, if you've got questions, if you find that you would like uh, us to talk about a topic in more detail than we are, please chime in. If you think that we're moving along too slowly, just let us know. Just give us a little, you know, a nudge in the chat and we'll make sure we'll uh, move, move things along. Um, so let's start by um, defining what learning friction is. And to help us do this, we've uh, created a poll. So we're going to have, uh, you'll see a poll get launched momentarily. And if you, if you don't mind, there are two questions in the poll. So just take a minute and answer the poll. And I think it'll be really useful to see what, um, uh, you as the audience uh, are thinking about in terms of learning friction. We'll actually review the poll results just in a minute. So we'll launch the poll now. Um, and um, in fact, now I'm being told that I need to launch the poll. So I'm going to do it. Hit launch poll. Um, so now every time I have to multitask, the older I get, the more stressful multitasking becomes. That's friction right there for you. Uh, but I've just launched the poll. So someone please answer the poll so I know that it's working. I see poll, I see poll answers, great. Um, so please take a minute and answer those two questions and we'll, um, I'll end the poll in a minute. So what is learning friction? Uh, to me, there are two aspects of learning friction. Um, 
and one is psychological and and that's sort of like well i'm not really interested in the training and so i'm going to be resistant to any uh, to really wanting to learn to really engaging my mind um, that's a significant piece of learning friction that i think we all are familiar with now not all training is going to cause learning friction there'll be trainings where i'm more uh, um, personally invested in um, but there'll be others where it will feel like do i really have to do this um, I'm you know, too busy for this. And so there's psych psychological learning friction. There's also logistical learning friction in that, oh, wait a minute, I know I need to take that training. Where do I go again? Um, oh, and there's how many steps that I have to click and what's my password again and where's that URL? So all those things or sort of logistical obstacles can also represent learning friction. Um, so that's how I define learning friction. Uh, Stephen, can I ask you what, what's your, when you think of learning friction, what do you think about? Well, no, I, I, I think uh, I would second both of those. It definitely is there's psychological. There's a lot of reasons. And one of the people asked uh, in the chat, are we talking about new employees? Or are we talking about existing employees? And it really doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's, it's, this is just a people thing, right? People have all sorts of reasons they don't want to do things, right? So there's definitely the psychological behind it. Um, and actually, it's really interesting. So we're seeing, if you look at these results, um, we're seeing that, uh, it's it's all over the place, but we're seeing that both 50% uh, of people uh, seem to be engaged uh, and that we think there's about a 50% retention, uh, which I actually will talk about in a minute, I think is actually high. Um, but the reality is, is that we're constantly seeing that people psychologically don't want to do things. And we're seeing that there's lots of reasons technically why they can't do things. So we'll talk about all that. Great. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the poll. I'm always interested in, um, uh, w you know, what your initial thoughts are when we have questions like this. And let's just take a minute to review the poll. I did click on sharing poll results. I'm hoping everyone can see them. Just chime in, in the chat if you can't see the poll results. But let, let's just take a minute and review them. So this first question, on a scale of one to five, how engaged are your learners? One being not engaged and five being a completely engaged, as Stephen alluded to, the majority, 71% of you said that about 50% engaged. Well, in school, that's still an F, <laughs> um, but hey, it's better than, uh, better than the first two options. Um, the second question, a month after a training course, estimate the average retention rate for your organization. Um, so again, here, the 53%, so the majority of you said 50%. And, you know, maybe that's, I'd be curious, a good follow-up question would be, is that acceptable? Is that an acceptable number in terms of the organizational investment in that training to have 50% retention? Um, it'd be curious. Maybe in the, in the chat, I'll ask that question and informally um, answer. Uh, is that an acceptable rate of retention? Uh, I'd, be love, I'd love to uh, get your take on that. So let's dive into um, more, some of the solutions. Uh, to do that, uh, I've asked, as Stephen and I were preparing uh, for this webinar, uh, he had this model that he wanted to talk about to set the age for our solutions. And so, Stephen, take it away. Yeah, so this is a really common model, and you know, I can't take ownership of it. We've actually seen a lot of sources where it's been uh, built and rebuilt and reused. And quite honestly, I wanted to use this as a framing to just start the conversation. Ultimately, I think you're going to see some people are going to find that their training is incredibly effective. Some people are going to find that it's incredibly uh, ineffective. And I think it talks about starting with what type of training are you doing? What type of um, media are you doing? Are you doing lectures, reading, audio, visual, so on and so forth? I break that down and, and this model does the, exactly that. It into both passive and active training experience. And my premise is the more active your training can be, and there are lots of ways of making active training experience, um, the more that people are gonna retain. And it's really just because people are getting their hands on your content and they're engaging with it on a much deeper level. So I wanted to kind of start there. And I, and I think a lot of what we're gonna be talking about leans in that direction, but I think that it's important to almost look at this and say, okay, um, you know, interesting enough, if you look at this um, chart, 50% uh, falls around using discussions and everything below that, demos, audio, visual, reading lectures, is really someone sitting there and watching you as opposed to getting their hands dirty. And that's where things start to, if that's what you're doing exclusively, start to fall off from a retention standpoint. Mm. Yeah, you know, to me, this is like a common sense type of check for me when I look at this and I think about how I learn things. 
and of course, when I'm more involved in, in sort of more of the active activities that are displayed on this chart, I know that I'm just going to learn and re retain things uh, more effectively. So it's, it's a really helpful model to get started with. Um, so we have five solutions that we're going to recommend to you to make uh, learning less, have more, have, what, what's the word, more frictionless. That's what I'm trying to say. And so let's go to number one. So our first solution we would like to recommend is microlearning. So what is microlearning? Microlearning is bite-sized and easy to consume training. Uh, you know, we say here three minute blocks, it's, it's just short. Um, and microlearning has been a buzzword over the last few years, um, but the principle is short, bite-sized, consumable, um, consumable learning. And I think that this is particularly important in the workplace because um, in the workplace, we have this idea of, of workflow. And if I can um, consume learning within my workflow, and, and that provides more context for me uh, versus sometimes being in a long workshop um, where I'm taken away from the context of my, of my work environment, sometimes it gets a little harder to connect the dots. And so there's a lot of advantages to this idea of micro learning both logistical, both in both parts of the uh, learning friction that we talked about, both psychologically as well as logistically. Um, so Stephen, what are your thoughts on micro learning? Yeah, so I have a few thoughts on this. Um, the first one is actually, I almost wanna uh, comment, well, no, not almost want to, I'd like to comment on one of the things that just on the chat. Um, sometimes I hear this a lot. Well, what if I have really complex uh, information that I wanna train on? Can I do it in, in a micro format? And I actually think that when it's complex, it's even more important to do it in a micro format. Mm -hmm. I think that in many ways, you can take things that are very detailed, very deep um, uh, information and break it up into bite size. And you're gonna have a better chance of having people retain that information as a result. Um, and and you know, the reality is, and, and uh, Vince has in the next several slides, examples of that, micro learning can come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, right? So if you don't mind going to the next slide, I mean, we, you can do, and I encourage people to do, and we do this um, you know, for, the, for the content that we build, uh, really doing uh, a, a combination of videos, podcasts, infographics, games, um, making sure that everything is small. And, and I think what's almost before we even get into some of those examples on the next few slides, I think it's important for us to think about um, why. And the biggest reason in my mind is as consumers or as people um, in our everyday lives, we are uh, so distracted by all the things around us, right? And that doesn't stop when you get into the office. It's probably almost even further accented, right? So, you know, the reality is, is that, um, you know, I think about myself and I, I, I might as well um, uh, have attention deficit disorder because, uh, you know, I see my email, uh, you know, pops up with a new email and I get a text from someone, then someone comes over to my desk and asks me something and so on and so forth. And the reality is if I'm trying to consume a 30 minute course, um, or I'm trying to consume a 30 minute uh, in person session, that's really hard to do. So how do you break it up into bite-sized content? Um, and so, so uh, there's lots of ways of doing that. Video is great for, uh, as, as a starting point. Uh, and video can be built in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This is probably among all the ones I'm gonna show you, the only one that I would say is probably still on the passive side. Um, but it could be entertaining. And I think that that in many ways is potentially gonna drive someone back to do it over and over again. If you look at some of the uh, companies here, some of the products beyond Powtoon, Movely, these are all really nice tools that you can pick up and uh, use yourself. They have um, easy tutorials, but quite honestly, I, I've played around with each of these and figured out how to build some really compelling content on my own. So that's the first thing to start with. Um, and I'd and also then, say, oh, no. Stephen, that um, yes, videos can, of course, they tend to be more passive, but there's technology coming out now where uh, there's some really cool things you can do to make video more interactive. And certainly in the future, um, it'll be a lot easier to make videos more interactive, pausing, um, you know, having uh, places where you can sort of choose your own path and things like that. So that's, a, that's actually a really exciting um, trend for interactive videos. Yeah, com I completely agree with you, Vince. And when we get to some of the games, one of the ones that... Um, Dr. Neb example that I mentioned, well, that will actually show just that. So it's a, it's a great point you're making. Um, podcast, once again, I think is just about repeat, repeat, repeating content, making something uh, that is on a certain cadence, right? So 
I think you can build some really compelling, um, you know, two to five minute podcast to get some key points, some key storylines, some key takeaways in place, have someone in and out, but make sure that they're actually getting content. It doesn't have to be deep and it doesn't have to be long for it to be impactful. Uh, I think once again, also uh, infographics are great. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I'm a storyteller. I need visuals and I'm definitely a visual learner, right? So being able to break down complex information into a whole bunch of bite-sized images, numbers, and key takeaways is really helpful for me. And I think that I see that that, that is often helpful for a lot of our learners as well. Yeah. I also like what, one thing I love about infographics too, they're a fun thing to share. And I think sharing um, is a big part of learning. And so I think like oftentimes when we're designing training, if you can think about, you know, how can I make this learning experience, one where I want to, where your learner will want to talk about it and share what they've learned. And, and if I go and, and share something that I've learned, I'm going to be, my retention rate for that learning is going to be so much higher. And infographics are just a great way to do that. I, I think one thing along the lines of all this, um, events is that to think about how do you make your content, um, in, in the format of edutainment, right? How do you educate and, and, and entertain people at the same time. And I think the more that you can draw them in, whether it's a story, whether it's a visual, whether it's an interaction, I think that the more that you're actually going to be able to get them to stick. Um, so the edutainment part is important and the micro part is important because it's really hard to tell a long, deep, compelling story um, unless it's gonna go to the movie theater, right? So I think we need to think mm -hmm. about combining those two objectives. So Stephen, something tells me you've seen these slides already because that's a great segue into the next one. Solution number two. Um, I know that was totally cheesy <laughs> dad joke, but I have a PhD in dad jokes, folks. So um, I only have a master's <laughs> there, but if I have a fourth kid, I might get to my PhD. So yeah. All right. Well, hey, young Padawan, just follow along. <laughs> Solution number two, make training fun. Fun is not a bad word. Training doesn't have to be so for, well, I mean, of course, some training topics are formal, but even then, if it's fun and engaging, this is just common sense, folks, people are gonna retain it more. They're gonna be engaged more. It's gonna be, uh, you're gonna really tackle that psychological friction in, in learning. And so here's stories, props, videos, games. You can see the list on the slide. Um, making training fun, and that's what we're trying to do with this webinar too. Can we make you smile? Can, you make we, can, can we make you roll your eyes a little bit? Uh, it's going to just make you pay attention a little bit more. So, Stephen, say something fun. Oh, gosh, that's really, really challenging. <laughs> but all right, well, I, I do want to dig into some of these because some of these are things that we may not be thinking about. Um, and, and I try to put on this slide some things that I think are relevant for both e-learning as well as instructional-led training. Uh, I think the ones that may be uh, ones we're not thinking about or people often don't think about are how do I build stories into my training, right? Not just make it factual, but build a story that people can relate to. I think as long as people can start to relate to something because they can remember a story and understand why it's relevant, that's gonna be really effective. I, I know it's super silly, but props I think are one of the best tools you can use. You know, it's, it's funny, I think of some of the, especially in some of the really uh, effective instructional training uh, sessions I've been to, people who will bring us, a, a, you know, basically a collection of props to tell that story, that often is something that people remember, right? You could also use those props and have people get their hands on uh, using those props themselves, acting things out, you know, simulating out different things. People remember that stuff. So I'm trying to, trying to put in here ways that we can use different techniques to have people retain what they've been trained. The, the last part um, that I want to focus on here is, uh, we're going to talk a lot about games, but I want to talk about competitions, talk about rewards, talk about the both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, right? So we focus on that, as you probably would not be surprised over the game agency a lot, is how do you tap into the things that people want to be better at, right? Uh, and and what, what are they, what's driving them to be the best of themselves? And then I also want to think about what are the little uh, carrots that you can dangle that are going to make people stay with your content, whether it's in a classroom or in an e-learning session, to hopefully come back over and over again and excel. So I think it's really important to think about how to use competitions, how to use rewards, how do you just use all the gamification components, so your points, your badges, your leaderboards, to drive people along.
Great. Uh, you sent me a couple examples. Do you, should we show a few or? Yeah, um, that'd be great. And I can maybe, we can uh, just pop them on each really quickly and I can just talk about um, them slightly. So this is, so, this is where Steven's asking me to multitask. Now I have to like exit <laughs> my slide, click another tab. Gosh, you're doing you know, great, if, Ben. If, you're doing if great. Steven's mustache hasn't thrown me off already, here we go. <laughs> so I'm going to hit play on here. So, um, so this, this very first example is, um, this happens to be our learning management system, uh, Motivate Cloud, but I, I, I use this because um, I believe our platform is like many in the market today in that we're focused on using games, using gamification, um, really to engage people. We're using badges to tell a story. We're building um, tangible rewards into it that people can get. Um, and we're trying to uh, drive people along. This one happens to be, as you'll see uh, here, it's all about that learning journey, right? So we literally built out um, you know, a, a flight uh, plan of all your courses that you could take, um, all the cities around the world where this client, it's, it's L'Oreal, happens to have, you know, uh, key places to be. You can win badges based on all their products. Um, and, and the whole idea is to really to engage people on a deeper level. I, I use this because this uh, takes the concept and brings it to life with A, a story, and B, visuals that are very much on brand and very much about driving that person along. So... I think that's all I wanted to show here, but uh, hopefully that's, that's a good starting point as it, as it pertains to this example. This next example, Vince, is, uh, goes along with what you were talking about earlier is how do you make video interactive, right? And so <clears throat> we built out here was, uh, uh, this uses the Training Arcade, which is one of our platforms also, uh, and, it, and we built out here uh, a simulation that uh, is all about doctor-patient engagement, right? And mini videos in this case it happens to be all illustrated animated video but you can do green screen video you can do um you know even stills with uh you know text boxes it's about driving that story and having then the uh the, the player weigh in and actually participating in what direction that story going to go so you choose your own adventure if you will right and i think that's really important is how do you build compelling content here you can see the players are actually deciding what's the doctor going to say how are they going to respond and what path is this conversation going to go down this is great for soft skills right so whether it is uh doctor patient engagement or quite honestly any anyone in professional services that regard sales training customer service training this is a way to get someone engaged in a very safe zone uh, and to practice those skills and fail and learn how to succeed in the future. Yeah. So I wanted to give that as another, another example. Yeah, that's, and by the way, these are really cool ex examples. And for those of you, and of course you can see the URLs on the screen, but we'll send you these links as well after, after the webinar if you want to uh, review them in more detail. Th this last one is uh, showing a scavenger hunt and how you can use this in your instructional web training. And I love this as a tool because and one of the things that uh, we pride ourselves on is getting, you know, excuse the language, but people's butts out of their seats and actually moving around, engaging with each other, engaging with the material. And, uh, and, and we believe that that is driving a greater retention, right? The more that you're sitting and you're just watching or listening, the less that it's going to be impactful. The more that you actually are hands-on or talking about it with your colleagues or participating with the content, the more it's going to stick. So... I'm a big fan of using scavenger hunts and quite honestly, games overall um, at events. And, I, and we find that it really drives a much deeper level of engagement. It has people competing, it has people collaborating, and it quite honestly has people remembering, which is the most important. That's great. So they all, that all sounds really fun. And that's a, a pretty obvious solution, but sometimes it's, it's actually hard to do and keep in mind. So uh, we encourage you to make the fun aspect a big part of your engagement strategy with your training programs. Let's go to solution number three. Um, so make training mobile. Now this is something I know a little bit about uh, here at Mobile Coach. And you know, the principle here is to meet people where they are. We all have our mobile phones with us and we all uh, have seen um, and have struggled with um, you know, the data around how much we're att attached to their own, our, our phones for, for better or for worse. Um, but again, if we're talking about frictionless, um, the, the number of steps it takes me to see something on my phone um, is obviously more frictionless than other means of getting to content. Um, so this is a really uh, telling statistic on this slide where the average person checks their phone 63 times per day. I wonder if 
I don't, I, can, I don't know how many times I do. I need to count it, but I wonder if I'm above or below that average. It might, actually might be scary to, uh, um, to know. But, you know, make training mobile. So, Stephen, what, what, what would you have to say about this? Uh, well, so we, we're big uh, believers in making things fully responsive and quantumously more and more we're building mobile solutions. Um, Rohit said something here that I think is really interesting in the chat, which is uh, focusing on creating human connections. And that doesn't have to necessarily just be in stories. It's one of the things that I love about Mobile Coach, right, is that you're actually engaging with somebody and you're, you're speaking to their every, uh, you know, to who they are and going down a path that's relevant and giving them the information they need. And quite honestly, we're all used to that on our phones and having immediate access, immediate answers. And I think it's really important to have that be part of our training strategy overall. Um, one of the things I also want to mention, and I saw further up in the chat, someone mentioned something about, well, is it infographic really training? And quite honestly, one could say, um, you know, is it game training? Is, is a chat training? You know, the reality is, in my mind, training comes in all shapes and sizes. It's about uh, delivering information and making somebody a smarter person or more effective person in the long run, right? So that may be, it, 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 in my mind, that can come in any shape or size, as long as it's actually accomplishing that goal. Um, and I think mobile is a great and quite honestly a critical place to do so. One of the, the thanks, Stephen. One of the uh, interesting things I've noticed over the last few years with mobile is maybe four or five years ago when we were trying to work with um, organizations and delivering mobile based training was this um, unclear policies around how organizations should treat training on a mobile device because so few companies were were, were purchasing phones for their employees. And so, you know, there was this policy debate of what, what do we do? Um, we're seeing that less and less because I think organizations have just sort of raised the white flag to say people are going to be on their phones. So it might as well have a presence on them. And again, if you have this mentality of, hey, we don't want to coerce people to learn, but we want to make it engaging, we want to make it part of the workflow, then you'll find that people will more than willing, willingly pick up their phones and are willing to learn to help them be better employees. And so um, making training mobile is almost, I mean, yes, it's a solution here, but it's almost a must have in, uh, in terms totally of uh, any, any strategy. Let's, let's move on to solution number four, pre and post training activities. Uh, Stephen, can you just, why don't you introduce this solution for us? Yeah. So we actually originally made this about pre assessments and um, uh, in 11th hour, um, unbeknownst to Vince, I changed this to focus on both pre and post. Cause I really think it's important when you think about your training, once again, whether it's e-learning or instructional led training is you look at the full cycle, right? So I think it's really important to excite your learners up front, right? And I think that can be by telling stories, by building entertaining content. But I think in that process, it's not only delineating, so, uh, delivering some information, but it's also assessing what they know. I think that's really important to do up front. And we'll, we'll, we'll sh show you some tools that can do that. At the tail end though, I think it's equally important to say, all right, well, we got you excited. We gave you some basic information. We brought you in for either a course or for a full day or two or three, um, but we got to keep delivering more information. So how do you continue to make that learning path a successful one, right? So we really believe in looking at it as, as a full life cycle. And if you jump to the next slide, I think this one is, is a good example. Once again, this goes to some of the tactics, whether it's games or contests, incentives, leaderboards, prizes, but making sure that you're surrounding all of your training content with those types of things, right? Um, we have a platform that we recently launched called the Challenge Hub that focuses on this. And, and there are lots of tools that can do this. I think that it's really critical though to deliver before, during, and after, and to make sure that you're keeping people interested, um, that you're reinforcing your information, you're, you're basically assessing them along the way, and honestly, where you can, you're building unique uh, training paths for people who are at different levels. And so I think that uh, as, as doing the combination of all those things is ultimately going to make somebody uh, much more successful at their job. Yeah, I think if you are invest in, in sort of the learning journey idea, uh, where you're not just invested in a single event, then that's going to help you think about the context. You know, it's sort of like this, one of the principles in design thinking is, you know, think about the actor, the person, and what's happening in their day-to-day work, -day work uh, workflow. And so in that context, if you can create some pre and post act, uh, activities, you're going to help them connect the dots better in their mind of why this training is, is important and how they can um, implement that training 
in in their work, which is of course the whole point of training. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on to the last and final solution. Drum roll, please. Solution number five: simplify. One of uh, so I'm a technologist. I build software, and and when you're building software, you do a lot of um, wireframing and screens and like okay, how do we, you know, when people want if you want someone to click this button, where's that button on the screen? And one of the hardest things to do when you're designing software is to make it simple. And that's why when you go to websites or you uh, interact with certain softwares, it can be very confusing because there's so much on the screen because in the design process, it's a hard thing to do. People are trying to stuff everything in uh, into a single view. So it's, uh, and I think that principle really applies in um, designing learning journeys as well. It's hard to make things simple. It is simple to make things hard, especially when you have multiple stakeholders, everyone saying, hey, the training needs to do this, this, and this. If you've got five people saying that, you now you have 15 things that you have to try to squeeze into a learning experience. Um, so Stephen, how do we make things simple? Well, I, I, I do think it's about building content that's gonna be compelling. I think it goes back to that micro content. I think it's about thinking about things that are gonna, um, bring us back over and over again, right? Um, and that quite honestly is gonna make it a pleasant experience. I always actually use um, the, the example of Netflix, right? When I'm sitting, whether it's um, with my wife or my children at Netflix, looking to try to figure out what am I gonna watch? I spend more time figuring out what I'm gonna watch than I end up watching it, right? So you wanna make that <laughs> navigation into the training fast and simple, and you wanna make the training simple, and you wanna make sure that uh, they feel like they got in, they got that information easily, and they'll come back for more. And I think that the more we can simplify, um, whether it's as technologists or as trainers, the more effective uh, our material is going to be and more, more it will stick. Now from a, of course, with any project, uh, if you're running the project and creating the project, you're going to have a lot more context than your audience. And so one of the uh, trickiest temptations is, or, or traps, I would say, is to assume that your, your audience is going to care about it as much as you, you know, they're just not. And so um, to make things as simple as possible, you know, cut out what's not necessary um, or make, um, you know, give accessibility to those that want more to go more in depth and make that an option for them. But to think, keep the journey very, very simple, you're just going to get greater learner engagement. Those are our five solutions. You're all going to get these slides. Um, uh, after the webinar, plus a recording uh, with these, um, you know, with this webinar. Um, now what we're going to do, we're going to take a minute and talk about how games are a great solution, overall, overall solution to these five uh, tips that we've given you, and how chatbots are. And so we're going to start with games. And so I'm going to uh, move here and let Stephen talk about games, unless you want to switch. Stephen, you want to talk about chatbots and have me talk about games? I, I, I can, but I think it will be a very boring uh, <laughs> webinar for people. So um let's let we'll make it fast we'll make it micro we'll make it entertaining and and then uh and then we'll do the same like on your side. Okay. so um as, as it pertains to games and we use this example this is one of uh many uh, turnkey games that we have available for people it's about how do you take content and weave it into a compelling environment right so this happens to be the jump game um and this is part of the training arcade which we'll talk about shortly uh but i think it's ultimately about combining compelling gameplay with uh, some of the fundamentals. So part of that is delivering some of the pre-context that so we um, have uh, the ability to deliver video and some pre-information for people as to what they're learning. Then we have the ability to have them play a fun game and assess them along the way. Um, if we jump to the next slide, I'll kind of talk about, in my mind, some of the, the major things and benefits when it comes to gaming. First of all is, Games have the ability to actually draw people in and keep their attention. And I think that's really critical. I think that is when we talk about the friction, often, uh, you know, it is I am so bored or I am so distracted or I have too many things to do. Games draw people in and they keep them there. And I think that's really important. Um, they also have the ability to be just naturally, they're competitive and they're collaborative. And as a, as a, as a result, they bring some amusement and they bring people back over and over again. And you know, I, I often use this uh, study. We did a study of a thousand games uh, from the training arcade and saw that the average person came back 3.1 times to play the game. Um, each session was about six minutes. 
so about 18 minutes in total. But the, the 3.1 is the one that I always focus on because I say to trainers often, how as often is it that your uh, learners say, I want to come back for two more sessions of your training to do the exact same thing I just did, right? Not very often. And I think that's really important because one of the things is you build compelling content into your games. You can draw people back over and over again, and you're going to reinforce that information. And that's going to drive better retention. And that's the last thing is, the, you know, the, the greater the retention, you know, obviously the more effective they're going to be. I think it's, a, no, that's okay. Sorry, Vince, you, you can jump ahead. Um, I, I, you know, and the, the more retention, the greater the ROI of your, 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 your expense. These are a bunch of examples of games that you can do. There's, there are, the wonderful thing about games are, there are literally hundreds of game mechanics out there. And we, we have, you know, dozens and dozens um, over at the game agency and, and, and a lot in training arcade, but it's about mapping the right game to your content, right? So what is your training objective? What is your performance objective? What do you want somebody to be able to do when they're done with uh, your training? Do you, you want them to be better communicators? Do you want them to understand your product better? Do you want them to uh, understand process better? And there are lots of different games and identifying the right one is important because if you do, you can really use it as a real simulation to drive those skills and those performance objectives. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks, Stephen. And I'm going to talk about chatbots now just very briefly. And for those of you uh, on the webinar, thank you for hanging in there. We actually did a really cool, this is going to blow your mind, but a chatbot plus a game integration that we want to show off. I'm going to show that off in just a couple of minutes. So I'm going to talk quickly about chatbots and then we're going to sh show that off to you. I would love to get your feedback on, on what we did. So chatbots. Uh, chatbots keep the learner's journey, journey moving. So the principle behind a chatbot is from a, from a software perspective, a chatbot is a conversational user interface. And that means the user interface is a conversation. And so you can see on the left, it's chatting. And a chatbot can be on a mobile device, like the screenshot shows here, or it can be on a desktop through a chat window, um, versus a graphical user interface, which is more traditional software, where, you, where you've got menus and buttons. And, and there's a place for both. We're not here to say that a chatbot um, should be all software, um, but there are, are times and places where a chatbot's just going to be so much more engaging than traditional software. Traditional software usually means username and password. It usually means a learning curve of figuring out, okay, where's my app again, and how do I do this again, and how do I search for this again? So the number, just the, the logistical number of steps to, for the user to get from, hey, I need that content to get to that content, um, in a traditional graphical user interface is many more steps than just simply chatting. Uh, and so we find that chatbots are a great way to have a conversation piece of, of learning going. So in terms of light micro learning, can you quickly have a chatbot send a link to a short video or suggest a short exercise? Absolutely. Can you have chatbots be fun? A chatbot can have a fun personality because you're having a conversation with this virtual bot. Um, so there are a lot of ways that a chatbot can utilize these five solutions that we've recommended uh, to keep learning uh, really engaging. Um, so I just wanted to show a couple uh, screenshots of examples of what an interaction could look like. Um, and again, all of these interactions are uh, showing SMS uh, chatting. Um, but um, SMS is not pervasive all over the world, so you could have chatbots on mobile, common mobile messaging channels like Facebook Messenger, like WhatsApp, like um, you know, Line or WeChat. And again, the idea is if I'm a custom, everyone already knows how to chat. I'm chatting with my friends. I'm chatting with my family. If there's a chatbot that's adding value to my life, uh, and particularly my work life in this context, then we have found that people are more than willing to also chat with the chatbot. And so can you have your chatbot on the same so messaging channel where I'm accustomed to messaging my inner circle of friends and family and colleagues? And if you can do that successfully, you can have unprecedented access to the learning journey of, of, that, of that learner. So it can be a very compelling way to make learning extremely frictionless. So you know, that, that's our spiel about uh, chatbots. Um, I now want to invite our, at Mobile Coach, we have a director of uh, chatbot design who just coincidentally has a master's degree in game design. Um, Paul, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. All right. Thanks, man. You bet. Paul, I'll, I'll um, let you show off what you did here. Yeah, thanks. I'll start my video here. 
Um, so yeah, this is a, um, I'm really excited about this. This is an integration between the training arcade and mobile coach. Um, and since I'm a bird watcher, um, the example I created here is about um, identifying some common backyard birds. But of course, this content could be anything. It could be any training content relevant to um, your organization. But so what we're doing here is we've sent a keyword to a phone number to start the course. And it's gonna ask a couple um, just simple questions. And then once I answer those, it's gonna take me directly into a training arcade game um, relevant to this course. And what we're doing is we've created a connection between the mobile coach platform using the training arcade API um, to have your chatbot and your game talk to each other. Um, so activity on the chatbot um, can take you into the game and activity on the game can be known by the chatbot. So they're talking back and forth in the background while you're um, playing your game and working with your chatbot. So now we're in the game and we're just making sure it's the same user as the chatbot user. And as soon as I hit the submit button here, that connection will be made. And so my game activity um, from here on out will be known by the chatbot. And one cool thing that I noticed in testing this is once I put in my name and email once, later sessions, um, you know, Stephen was talking about multiple sessions of your game and how these games bring people back. In future sessions, you don't have to put in your name and email again. It remembers who you are um, just by default. So here in this game, this again is the jump game that the Training Arcade offers. Um, this is one of my favorite games in the Training Arcade because it feels the most like a video game but still has that training um, aspect to it. So what's happening is when I land on these question marks, I'm getting a picture and I'm being asked to identify that kind of bird. Um, and as we go through this, you know, I get some right and some wrong. And then once I lose the game, um, I'm sitting here trying to lose on purpose. And we'll lose here in a second. And what happens is the second this session is over, the training arcade tells the chat bot what questions I answered how many times I answered them, and if I got them right or wrong. And so now that I finished the game, you'll see a text pop up on my screen. I'll go back into my chat bot. And this is really the magic of what happens right here. Um, so it says, I recommend studying the house sparrow. Out of 14 attempts, you have identified correctly seven times. Learn more about the house sparrow here. And that's really the experience we want to create with this integration. We want you to play the game, learn the content, dig in, but then what the chatbot can do, um, living up to our name of mobile coach, the chatbot can identify, okay, here's your strengths, here's your weaknesses, uh, let's try to improve. So let's learn, let's study some content, and then let's dive back into the game and try to improve in our next play session. Um, and one quick story about this. So uh, when we made this demo, I sent it out to my team, had them try it. And um, one of our colleagues, she got really into it. She wanted to be at the top of the leaderboard. Um, so she played the game multiple times. And then her husband walked in the room while she was playing and he said, I didn't know you knew anything about birds. And cause she was answering every question right. And that's cause she had done the game multiple times. And I think that story encompasses everything we're talking about here. You know, it got her to learn something new, it got her to care about it, and it got her to interact with it multiple times. And I bet if I showed her those um, pictures today, she would still be able to identify those birds. And again, birds don't matter. It could be any content, but that's the power of the games and engagement and um, this frictionless experience. It's on her phone, it's easy to access. She wanted to play, she wanted to be at the top of that leaderboard. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I'm really excited about this. I think you can do a lot for training in general. Well, ba Paul, I will say that birds do matter. Hashtag birds matter. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I'm sure you've never heard stories of people being so engaged in a the game, they actually learn something in spite of themselves. <laughs> I, I love those stories. And quite honestly, it makes me feel great about what we're, we've built. Um, we also have a really cool pipeline of a bunch of more games coming out um, there. And, and so I love hearing that people are a able to build games pretty quickly with the content that's interesting to them, but probably more important than that, that it's effective in actually driving um, uh, that, that, that learning experience. So that's, that's great. I, I hadn't heard that yet, Paul, and um, <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, you bet. For sure. 
Well, um, we're willing, I'm willing to stay on just for a few more minutes and seeing if anyone has any final questions. Uh, and please put them in the chat. We're happy to um, answer those questions. Just a matter of housekeeping. Again, I've said this a few times already, but everyone look out for an email uh, with a recording, link to the recording and these slides. If anyone has any questions even after today's webinar about your situation, about ideas that you have, please reach out to either Stephen or myself. You can see our contact information on the screen. Um, but uh, any, any questions? Um, ben, I, am, I am seeing one question, which is about uh, how long it takes to develop this game um, and integrate into chat bot experience. So I'm going to answer the first part um, in two ways. And, and then I'll ask that Paul um, validate the second part and answer yeah. the third. So um, we, we've now built eight games into the training arcade and we have uh, probably four more coming out this year, which we're really excited about. Um, for, for us to build the games, they're normally, uh, you know, two to four month cycle to build out the games in, and build them into our platform. But I think your question that um, is being asked by Melissa is, um, how long does it take you as a trainer to actually create a game? So we've designed all of our games so that really, as long as you have the content, you can build a game yourself in under 30 minutes. So I'm curious, Paul, you built this game, or I, th I think you built the one that you showed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is that a, is that, was that pretty consistent with your experience in building it or take the Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So building the, the training arcade side of it. Um, and I didn't have any training, you know, game agency didn't tell me how to use it. So I just jumped in and could click around and it was very intuitive. So yeah, I would say about a half hour to build that part and really only about an hour to work out um, the integration between the chatbot and the game. So definitely, you know, this is the kind of thing that um, if, like Steven said, if you have the content and you know what you're going for, um, it's very low barrier in terms of time and resources in order to get in there. Yeah. So maybe just to follow on that, uh, those answers, guys, functionally, um, for someone to um, be able to create a game agency game, Stephen, what do they just do? Do they need a license or how, how does that work? Well, yeah, thank, thanks for asking. So we, if you go to the training uh, you, you can do a, you can sign up for a free two week trial, play around with the tool. Um, and we're happy to sit down on the phone and work through building a game uh, with you. If you'd like that, as Paul said, it's pretty intuitive, do it yourself, but um, sometimes some people prefer that. So we're happy to build a game with you. And uh, there are eight different games that you can play around with. And you can today subscribe to either one or all eight of them. Uh, and it's an annual subscription, um, but pretty straightforward. Steven, there's also a question just popped in from uh, Lisa that I think pertains to you. Oh yeah, so eLearning Brothers. Um, we, we work with eLearning Brothers on a very deep level. They are a reseller of our platform. Um, and uh, they, you, know, they, you can use all of the games if you're buying them through them, through us or any other resellers. It doesn't matter to us. Um, we just like you to buy our games. So. Uh, and one of the things we really worked on doing is making them uh, so that they can integrate into any platform. So um, they're all SCORM compliant. They all uh, integrate really nicely using SSO integration. They also integrate really nicely as web objects, embed objects, SCORM packages. So, um, but yeah, if you're working with eLearning Brothers uh, and you either are considering purchasing or have purchased through them, it all works exactly the same way. Great, thanks, thank you. I'm also looking that there are some questions in the Q&A. We'll, we're answering those in the Q&A. Any other questions that we're missing here? Um, oh, there's a question from Rohit. Is the mobile coach on its own platform or can it be used in other platforms? So the mobile coach is a chatbot authoring platform. It's, it's meant for you to, similar to what we're talking about authoring games, you can author all the logic and what the chatbot says, but then we support other platforms where people interact with the chatbot. So whether that's through SMS or through Facebook Messenger or through your own websites, um, basically you create your chatbot logic and then you can deploy it in whatever channel makes sense for your audience. And so the, uh, the demo that you saw Paul build, you know, that chatbot experience could happen on your LMS through, an, um, through a, a chat window in your LMS. So, so it does not have to be on a channel in, inherent with mobile coach. Thank you for your question. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. Of course, if you do have questions, please, we want to answer them. Send us an email. I want to thank everybody for joining, taking time out of your busy day to join us. I had a lot of fun. Please keep these five solutions in mind. Our passion is to make learning 
more effective, and hopefully this was helpful to help you do that. So, Stephen, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was really fun doing this with you guys, and thanks to everyone for attending. Appreciate everyone's uh, time and uh, participation. Great. Everyone, have a wonderful day. Bye.